Um, my topic today is the hanging together of research integrity and open science. Research integrity and open science happen in largely separate communities. And, and my point today is that these communities should come together at least to some extent. And, and what I mainly want to put uh, to your attention is that uh, open science practices, some of them can really help to detect problems with research integrity and also to prevent problems with research integrity. What I have in the menu are a few uh, slides on the core concepts. Uh, then I try to list the most important current problems uh, we're trying to solve with open science practices. Um, then I come back to the hanging together of the two and say a little bit more about open methods and open data, because I believe that these two elements of open science are most important for research integrity. Uh, and then I'll dwell a little bit on how we can improve matters by using open science practices and other measures to improve research integrity. And I'll build that up from uh, the drivers of problems uh, we have discussed before during the talk. So that is the rhythm uh, for this uh, lecture. Um, and to start, and to me and um, also to many other people, research integrity is about behavior. It's about behavior of researchers, individually or collectively, and behavior only in the sense that it bears on truth and trust, on the fidelity of and the trust in research findings and also in researchers as a class or as in individuals. Um, research integrity shows that the behavior can go in two directions. It can promote research integrity and it can hamper research integrity. And I'll show you some examples of that later on. Um, now, trust is a weird thing. Um, it needs to be deserved. And, and you need to, to deserve it by being trustworthy. Now, how can you be trustworthy? Uh, mainly by being transparent, I believe. Uh, transparency means that you're open, everyone can check that you do what you promise to do and redo what you laid out uh, as, as your plan. And in research, that means that your research plans, your research methods, your research data analysis plan, and also your data need to be out in the open. That makes you vulnerable, but people can trust you because there is the possibility to check what you did. And a number of these open science practices, and you could argue that that holds for many of them, enables accountability. We can check what people do in research and, and that is a good thing, I believe. And, and that is the way you deserve uh, trust. Some data. Uh, we did a national survey in our country a few years ago on research integrity. Um, and, and Gauri Kapalakrishna was the poster who, who did really did the work. So I'm presenting her work. What we did is we sent out a questionnaire to many people uh, in research. In fact, we tried to reach everyone in academic research. And we asked them about questionable research practices. These are behaviors most people think you should not engage in. Uh, we had 11 of these behaviors. They came from other lists and other studies. Uh, by the way, there have been about uh, 43 uh, surveys on uh, these research theory issues, issues already. This was a large one and a rather late one and, and a big one, but we are not alone. And in two systematic reviews, um, when you, you study them, you can see that our values are on the high end of the scope, but, but completely within the scope of other studies. These questionable research practices, they could be scored on a scale uh, one to seven. Uh, one uh, is never, seven is always. Um, and they specify the behavior in the last three years. Uh, Preferences are the upper end of the scale, five, six, and seven taken together. And when you look at five of these 11 questionable research practices, you see that negative publication, uh, so not publishing a negative publication, uh, and, and, and that happens in 70.5% by the people. This is self-admitted. We should remember that it's a survey uh, so that might be an under uh, um, reporting, but, but still this is what people said. And we made them 
believe and would check that, that their identity was protected well. Study limitations and flaws uh, not mentioning sufficiently 70%, uh, insufficiently supervising and mentoring, which is a very important task in uh, academic research of your junior co-workers, it can be students, it can be PhD students, it can be postdocs, 50% self-admitted again, uh, and then giving insufficient attention to the stuff you use, the equipment, the skills, and the expertise, again, 50%. And another 50% admitted to inadequate note takings like lab journals and journals of what happens during your study. And when you take all 11 together, you get a prevalence of more than 50%, meaning that of our respondents, um, more than half declared to engage frequent in at least one of these 11 QRPs. This is not rare, so this is quite common. And we also looked at uh, the, the bigger evils uh, of research integrity, uh, fabrication, falsification, and self-admitted again, more than 4% of, for each of these things, making up data or results or manipulation of research material data or results. Now, that means that when you are in a department of, for instance, 25 people, on average, at least one is a fraud, a self-admitted fraud, and maybe two when you count them both. Now, it won't be your department, of course, it will be the neighboring department with double numbers, but still, this is also not really rare, and let's say there is some room for improvements here. More problems. Uh, recently, we've seen uh, the rise of paper mills. Uh, these are uh, companies, uh, factories, uh, websites that promise you an authorship on a paper if you pay for it. You don't need to write the paper. Uh, they give you just an authorship. Uh, people can, of course, fabricate papers themselves, or it can be done by software in paper mills. Eh? Chat GPT is, is quite popular now in paper mills, and it's, it's really good for their business, so to say. Uh, sometimes it's plagiarizing other papers or, or pasting and cutting from other papers uh, or, or making uh, uh, versions of other papers by, by using other words in, in the papers, uh, using synonyms for, for to be, not be able to detect by the plagiarism detectors. Um, and these companies sell authorships, as I said, and then you have fake authors on fake papers. And they also arrange for fake reviews to review these papers. And these companies also supplement fake conferences and fake guest editors of the supplements where the stuff in these of these so-called conferences is discussed. So detecting the whole thing um, is a major challenge. Uh, work has been done on software and some private persons uh, work as a detective almost 24-7 to detect this awful stuff. Uh, final problem, uh, which we all know about by now, is the replication prices. It, it happens to be the case that when you redo it, study, even when you do it exactly in the same way, you don't always get the same answer. Now, you cannot expect that in 100% of the cases, maybe, but still, this is a bit worrying. Um, and we call that the replication crisis. Um, it started in, in nature and science with articles in 2012 and 2015. Uh, the Royal Societies of the Netherlands and of the US uh, wrote, learned reports about it with many interesting details. Um, and recently a scoping review was preprinted, explaining um, in the quite last study summarizing uh, 177 uh, replication studies that only 95% was successful in replicating the initial step. So it seems to be a 50-50 issue that when you see a positive result, whether it would also be positive on replication. Uh, we can say a lot about it, but it is a problem and it is connected to a few of these uh, uh, questionable research practices I alluded to before, namely uh, selective reporting first and foremost. And here you see what I said so far, more or less 
summarized, I discussed about a little bit about fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Uh, we alluded to the questionable research practices. I also said that some of them are drivers, that is the red arrow of the replication crisis, research not being so replicable, and three trees together, I hope that you will uh, uh, agree with me, bear on what we want in science, and that is validity and trustworthiness, which was where I started my story. And I also already said that transparency is key to get validity and trustworthiness, and that open science can help you a lot to get transparency. So this is how these things happen uh, to be together quite closely, specifically open methods and open data can work as responsible uh, research practices as opposed to questionable research practices. And it can be argued and it can be shown as well that they help preventing the replication crisis, can help prevent the questionable research practices or detecting a questionable research practice when they are there. And it can also help in detecting fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, and maybe even prevent a little bit uh, by being a threat on the floor, uh, saying that we will get you when you behave poorly. So the green arrows is what we want to uh, pull down all these awful things in, in the red uh, gators. So this is the way these things ha happen to hang together in my opinion, and that is the core story of my presentation. Now, most of you will know that open science practices are a lot, and, and it, it seems to be a quite expanding universe, and, and it, it goes all over the place. It has mostly to do with transparency, but not all with research integrity. I focus in this talk mainly on, on the one hand, pre-registration and open protocols, and on the other hand, a little bit on open data. I might say a little bit about um, the goodies of open peer review later on, uh, and I will ignore the rest of this wonderful collection of interesting and important uh, and, and quite innovative, in, in, uh, innovative things. Uh, so open science is a lot more than I talk about today. When I say open methods, it, it can mean at least three different things. One is registration, that's what we say in biomedicine, or pre-registration, that what, that's what they say in the social sciences, of the essential features of study results. Yeah, that is the basic questions, uh, the methods, core elements, outcomes, and so on and so forth. Uh, we do that already a lot of clinical trials, as you know, uh, at, at least 30 years it's been in the air. It, it is mandatory, uh, at least for, for drugs and medical devices in, in some countries, uh, and it goes in the right direction. A lot of the stuff of the clinical trials is indeed registered before the data collection starts. That is the idea. Parked in the cyberspace somewhere uh, with a timestamp on it uh, where you can later see what they wanted to do and then check whether they indeed did it exactly the way they planned it. Uh, another version, uh, slightly better and completing um, and completer, is publication of your full study protocol uh, and also including the data analysis plan when you, when you do that. Uh, it can either be a real publication in the, in the digital journal or even a paper journal or a preprint server where it's on. It's, it's there again out in the open. You can see when it, it was posted there and you can see whether that happened before the data collection began. So you can check everything. And an even more important and interesting thing is the registered report. Um, and that is what my next slide will be about. Essential traits of registration of pre registrations are that it is prospective. You need to do it before the start of the data collection. It needs to be public. That's nice to have. That's not need to have because it can also be embargoed for a, an, an amount of time. And almost all these uh, portals the, the offer that possibility, although it's better uh, for transparency and also for accountability when it is public at least after a few months. And then of course, it is not um, a harness. You can make amendments, but then also these amendments to your uh, registrations or study protocols 
are timestamped and you can see later uh, whether they might be data driven to an extent that you're not going to believe, to believe anymore what the, these demand and amendments led to in the study. This is what I promised about the registered reports. Uh, you might know the format already. The ideal is, is simple and quite brilliant. Uh, it, it cuts the process of publication in two. First, you get the, an idea for your study, you get a grant, you get permission for the, from the ethics committee, and you're ready to go. Normally, you would then start data collection, but not this time. This time, you first write your paper, at least the, the first half of your paper. You write the introduction and also the method section. And that you send to a journal. And then the journal say, hey, do major re uh, uh, revision, minor revision. And then in the end of the day, hopefully they accept it. And then it is accepted for publication before you have data, before you started collecting your data. And that means that the editor and the reviewers were not distracted by your results. They cannot say, well, this is spectacular, we should publish it. No, they look whether the study is important and should have been done, relevant subject, you can read it in the introduction, and whether it will be done well, you can read it in the method section. The beauty of the thing is that it is a killer of publication bias. Uh, this is uh, a, a quite convincing um, non-randomized study of the thing. It's, it is in social sciences. Uh, uh, 71 uh, registered reports, 45% uh, of them was uh, uh, negative and uh, was positive, sorry, and 55% was, uh, was, uh, was, was positive. Uh, and almost all the other studies uh, matched, uh, double uh, control group matched, similar topics, similar journals, similar type of researches, and so on and so forth, similar designs. In these studies, more than 95% was positive. And and that means, and this is usual, you see that everywhere in, in journals, in many disciplines and subdisciplines, we only publish what we like and what we like are positive results. Uh, but when you remove that in the format of registered reports, you kill the publication bias and you get uh, this 55% uh, positive. And there is a bonus. The bonus is that the methodology is better of registered reports. This is another an uh, article, and it shows on all these indicators that the registered reports are better. Uh, we're not sure why that is, but it, it might be uh, important that here the study can still be changed when we do this peer review. Normally in peer review, many remarks on the methods of the studies are made, but it's quite useless because the study has been done already. It cannot be improved anymore. You can only write it up a little bit more beautiful, but you cannot do it differently then. But now you can decide to take a board a suggestion of a reviewer and to improve your study. Well, that might be an explanation partly of what you see here. Um, I can be quicker on open data. Most people have heard about fair open data reposition. It means findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. It's not easy. We are, are only discovering how to do it well, and it's different in different fields. The challenges are different. But the idea is beautiful that the data should be there in a usable way that other people can check what we did and also reuse our data for other purposes. And by the way, when they reuse it for other purposes, of course, they need to pre-register and say what they're going to do before they start looking at, at your data, of course. This combines the last two slides um, in, in, in some ways. It shows that uh, when you talk about uh, policy making, and uh, the slide is by Gilad Feldman, and it's inspired by stuff by Chris Chambers, uh, you always in, in textbook of epidemiology and, and evidence uh, and, and uh, evidence-based medicine, you see a pyramid of credibility of research designs. And this is somewhat similar, but now it, it the openness and the idea of the resistance report is included. Uh, 
this is uh, the normal stuff. Don't believe it, it basically says. Uh, when you have explorative open science, which is not uh, pre-registered, but at least you're, you make your data and materials available, that's a bit better. Uh, when you pre-register and you make your data available, it's confirmatory, op con confirmatory open science. That is a lot better. Uh, a registered report uh, is better uh, because of the day, uh, the reason I have this outlined before. Um, and here they say, what we need are meta-analysis of uh, registered reports. Usually you have the systematic review and the meta-analysis on top of the pyramid. They make it the meta-analysis of registered reports. And they say nicely that these, of course, should be pre-registered before as well and have open data. It makes a lot of sense. I've never seen this so far, a pre-registered meta-analysis of registered reports, but it will happen when registered reports uh, will get flowing, uh, which they don't do yet because only a little bit more than 300 journals have adopted them. But I believe it's a, a major innovation and it deserves uh, a flourishing future. Okay, there is a kind of cut in the story here. I now move on to what drive all these behaviors that, that, that have a good or a bad influence on research integrity. And I believe there are three categories. You have individual factors, institutional factors, and systemic factors. The virtuousness of the individual is important, but he or she is not working in splendid isolation. Uh, we are working in social uh, environments uh, so the research climate in the lab or in the research group is really important as well. And then you have the incentives. Uh, it's nice when they're adequate. It's all for when they are perverse. But I give a few examples um, of these three categories. Uh, but before that, I go back to my uh, national survey on research integrity. Uh, we call that explanatory factors there. We also looked in these drivers of research integrity a little bit by using scales that has been used and validated before and linking them to the answers on QRPs and fabrication of falsification. And another thing I haven't mentioned before, the responsible research practices. Uh, let's not get carried away. It's self-reported, it's processional, it's a survey. So let's not have dreams about causality. But still we wanted to see whether we could detect associations. And the arrows mean meaningful and statistically significant. Uh, the and green is, is what we want. The red is what we don't want to see. Uh, people who believe that reviewers could detect uh, their wrongdoings in papers, uh, which by the way is hardly the case, uh, have reported less fabrication and falsification. So having that threat in the air that might work. Uh, people who support the research integrity norms, uh, at least that's what they say. They also say that they engage less in QRPs, more responsible research practices, and also less in falsification and fabrication. Two survival scales. One, uh, the, the, well, let's say the, 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 the bad or the dubious survival, that's about supervising uh, to help you to cut corners, to get a lot of uh, citations and publications and grants. Uh, well, there are many supervisors who, who do it that way, maybe. Um, then that is what you get, more questionable research practices, uh, at least in the association. And the supervisors that help people to do the right thing in the sense of responsible research practices, open science modalities, uh, thinking before doing, uh, being kind, and helpful for your colleagues and so on and so forth. These people who have that style, they also report less QRPs and sorry, more uh, responsible research practices. Publication pressure is, is quite an issue uh, uh, and, and it's there. Uh, it, can, it, can re it can be measured quite well, we believe. Uh, and when people feel a lot of publication pressure, they engage more in questionable research practices and less in responsible research practices, which might be the case uh, because they take a lot of time. And when you feel publication pressure, you also feel time pressure. 
we have code of conduct where all these norms where people individuals adhere to or not uh, in in code of conduct on research integrity basically they all come from robert merton in in his beautiful 1942 article uh, later labeled as being the Mertonian norms uh, and and they're, they're still recognizable the first idea is it, he calls it communism communalism many people call it nowadays that means it's about sharing it's not your private property research you need to share it with the communities otherwise you get nowhere the second thing is it's not about you and what you consider to be true it's about something larger than the subject we try to be as objective and intersubjective as possible this one is about conflict of interest in modern terms um, you should do science for discovery how things work and to help to improve the world not for your own benefit and the, the one I like most is organized skepticism and that's close to transparency and open everything because that makes you vulnerable and open to criticism which is great and which is driving progress in academia I believe when we move on to culture you say you can say that uh, um, you need help as an institution there uh, and this is a great European consortium I was involved in standard operating for for standard operating procedures for research integrity um, these are guidelines how to do it well as an institution and we have to for funders as well these are the four guidelines for education uh, they're quite practical they're well used they're piloted and tested out and produced in in the right way with with co-creation uh, uh, surveys uh, workshops uh, uh, focus group interviews what what have you and we have them for the students for the the senior researchers for the helpers in research very important and also um, to get going and to do frappe toujours in the sense that people are uh, talking about research integrity many times in a year and not once in a one day course and there are many more there are to be honest 131 of these standard operating procedures please check it out uh, below this the slides below all my slides are all my references to websites and papers uh, and the organizers promise to have them on the website of the Concilium uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, let's also not forget that research is about, it's a human, um, a human thing, a human endeavor, uh, especially young researchers, early career researchers, and the people being their supervisors and their mentors, uh, they need to help each other in, in the right way. Uh, and it often goes like in this cartoon, uh, that the supervisors focus on content only uh, while the early career researchers has something uh, different on her or her, her, his mind. Uh, and, and that's the reason that mentoring and supervision is so important, we believe. And, and the software I has some guidelines about it as well. And we developed in Amsterdam uh, a course that we consider to be quite nice, although there's only uh, only a pilot uh, study available of it called superb supervision and here we try to combine doing the right thing for the people you supervise uh, and also to learn them the open science modalities that can help to improve research integrity uh, it's now taking on in other dutch universities and there are similar initiatives in the netherlands and abroad of course the issue is that we may need a license to supervise or maybe at least a few good courses to do it because in academia my opinion is it's one of the most difficult things uh, you have to do but it's also one of the most wonderful things you have to do let's move on to the incentives um, and the incentives often come in the form of um, assessment of researchers of, of grant proposals or whatever uh, assessment of for vacancies promotion tenure and award what have you and and still although we are trying to change it we tend to focus on the number of publications not so much their content the number and the number of citations 
and they work amazingly well. When you do this, you get more publications and more translations, yes. But there are some undesirable side effects uh, of focusing on quantity, not on quality. Uh, you get more plagiarism, you get more duplicate publication, you get salami slicing, that's meaning looking for the smallest publishable uh, unit. Uh, you get a lot of gift authorship because when I rub you back, uh, you can rub my back and we both have the double number of publications. Uh, and it leads to the popularity of paper mills and predatory open access journals because it's so easy to get publications in there and that they can help again for your career. So we need to reform that and we are already doing so, uh, but it's not easy. And in this narrative review, uh, Noemi uh, summarizes what is out there of the debate in the debate and also what are the promising developments to do it better in the assessment and also look at whether someone is good at uh, open science practices, is publishing his data sets, uh, is helping others when they want to reuse their data set, is a good supervisor, is a good teacher, is a great peer reviewer. All these things, uh, most people nowadays, many people at least believe that you need to get career points for that as well, because that shows that that is important. And it's not only the number of citations and publications that count. In summary, we need research integrity interventions, but we need interventions that work, that are evidence-based. And that is where meta research or meta science of or research on research come in. Um, we need to study and to document the effectiveness before we start to implement. Uh, and then when we do so, we need to measure several outcomes. Uh, well, it's the primary outcomes that really matters, like the incidence of FFP, uh, fabrication, false against plagiarism, questionable research practices, responsible research practices, research quality. That's not always easy to measure. And then you go to the intermediate outcomes like at attitude, knowledge, and skills. That is what all the teachers do in educational research. Uh, and the problem is it's only weakly connected, uh, most people believe, to the real outcomes. And then you can measure pro process, whether people like what you're doing, whether they do what you say, or at least say what they do what you say, and whether they believe that it is useful. Now, also that outcome measurement needs to develop better. We need better instruments and better scales. Um, and maybe in the long run, we need also what we see in clinical research already for decades, a core outcome set that is a set of outcomes that we um, promise to each other to all measure when we do intervention research on research integrity intervention, because that helps later systematic reviews greatly, of course. Uh, this is from Ryan Nosek. Once you have an, an evidence-based uh, intervention, you should first make it possible, then make it easy, then make it normative, and finally make it rewarding, and lastly, make it required. That is the thing, and we should go up in another pyramid. I won't talk about open applications, open funding uh, procedures, and open peer review. I'm a great believer in all these three things as well, and I believe that also here, transparency can help to boost validity and trustworthiness. But my time is up more or less, and I'd like to end by telling you that um, in Athens in June next year, the World Conference on Research Integrity will be organized. All the topics of this presentation and many more will be on the menu there. Uh, please have a look at the website and look whether it's interesting to submit an abstract. The call for abstract will go out uh, in a, one or two weeks. So you've got time enough to put your act together regarding this conference. And if you want more, go to the website of the foundation behind these conferences. Uh, we are active on Twitter as well. And we are running a female channel with, with many great talks. Um, for instance, of the symposium we had a few weeks ago preparing for the World Conference. Having said that, um, I thank you for your attention and I hand over uh, to the chair. Thank you so much, Lex. Excellent talk. Uh, lots of food for thought. So I'm looking forward to your questions. Feel free to raise your hands. Um, 
it would be nice if you turn your camera on when you ask a question. Um, while people are thinking about what they'd like to ask you, uh, like I have the first question. Uh, while you were talking, I just realized that when I was doing my PhD, I haven't even heard the combination of words research integrity. It never even came through in any steps of my process. And I did my PhD in the US. And um, has anyone done a survey or are there any data on how many PhD programs now have a research integrity courses, training requirements as part of the curricular? And um, next question is, for example, it looks like um, Netherlands is doing incredible job um, um, between you and uh, Professor Lackens and many other leaders trying to bring research integrity to the top of priorities. Um, amazing efforts, but how these efforts play in um, if bigger players, let's say countries that produce a lot more publications, are not on board? Um, yeah, it's it's it, it, two great questions. Uh, starting with the first one, I, I believe that um, in in many countries, and the Netherlands is one of them, it it's getting quite normal uh, to have a research integrity course for PhD students. Uh, However, it's not always mandatory. It's it's typically a one or two or maybe three day course, uh, and it's a standalone thing. And it it might not be effective when the rest of the environment doesn't know about it. I've taught a lot of these courses, and typical what PhD students say afterwards is say thank you. It was really interesting. It was new, and now play, please go on and tell it my boss and my supervisor. So we need to have courses outside that scope as well. Uh, and we it, it's about culture, it's about mentality, it's more than a course, but but the course is not a bad idea, of course. Uh, and and PhD students not always like the idea, especially when it's mandatory to go the, to these courses. Uh, but when they're there, they usually can recognize that it's about not the corporates out there, it's about them. It's about their tendency and temptation to cut corners. It's about their dynamics in the research, and it's about helping them to do better. Second question. Um, well, there is a lot going on, not only in the Netherlands, but in Europe. Um, thanks to the, the, the granting scheme of the European Commission that's focusing on research ethics, research integrity, and open science a lot. Uh, well, your country was not so clever and left the EU in, in, in that sense, but, but still many people from the UK participate in these programs, which is great. Uh, and what are we doing for the rest of the world? Well, it, it, that's what we're trying to do with the world conferences. We travel from continent to continent. Uh, last time we had Hong Kong and Cape Town. Uh, and it always makes a difference from, from the country. It, it will also make a difference in essence the next time, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and we focus very much on engagement of people from other communities. Um, at the World Conference, there was the Aryan started, the African Research Integrity Network. It's really eff uh, effective and active. There is a South American and Central American Research Integrity Network. It started as one of these conferences. And, and when you do open, access stuff like open videos and open Vimeo uh, 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 movies and so on, people can use it and can use the courses. So there's a lot of great material made in Europe, um, used elsewhere, and now it's catching up elsewhere. There's great stuff in Japan and Malaysia being made in Indonesia nowadays. We can use in Europe because it's better than the stuff what we, we use. So there is a kind of movement going on but it's, it's still a bubble, of course. It's, it's still for the insiders, and our big challenge is still to, to reach out to, to the other people. And, and well, that, that would take a few more, more years. We are maybe still in the stage of the early adopters, and, and it, it, it's still get, catching, uh, well, velocity, and, and there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? You mesmerized everyone. 
So uh, I do have another question, which is a very difficult one. So uh, is this not systematic um, data, of course, but what uh, I have noticed is that among young researchers, um, either students or who are just starting their career, there is a lot of embracing of these ideas, uh, really pioneering this work, uh, trying to pre-register uh, reports and uh, publications, and uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. Uh, and it's it's for young people, it's kind of common to be idealistic up to a certain point when the career kicks in. So, and my question to you is, in order for these people to keep these ideals and to actually do this work, uh, they need support from, from their supervisors, they need support from their institutions, they need support from the system. And for example, a lot of things you described is this kind of support from the system that they can find the support. There are conferences, there are all these movements. Uh, but what happens to students who or young researchers who see their supervisors who do not share these um, ideals, who actually do things which might not be right? And uh, speaking up about that may be completely risking their future, their careers, and um, everything. So any, any solutions for, for these people uh, who want to do right, but they might not be in the environment which enables them to do so? Yeah, you're completely right, of course. There, there are all types of tensions and, and dilemmas and difficulties. Uh, like I alluded to already, it is so important to get the senior people aboard as well, and also the leadership of institutions. And, and it's happening, but it's happening slowly, and there are still pockets of strong resistance. And when you're a PhD student in one of these pockets, uh, it's problematic. Well, what, what, what you can say cynically is that pick your supervisor wisely, but that's not always an option, of course. Uh, there are great supervisors, many of them, and there are awful supervisors who, who spoil even brilliant PhD students. That, that, that happens, that still happens. And that's the reason there needs to be a little bit more open um, mentoring from people outside the direct relationship. We have forbidden in our country, and that happened in other countries as well, uh, that as a PhD student, you have only one supervisor. You need to have at least uh, two or three or four, uh, and, and some institutions have an additional mentor in another department just to, to arrange for safety. But these young people, they're so wonderful. They are the motor of, of, of change and, and they are the future. Uh, another cynical remark can be we only need to wait a few years and then all these awful people will have retired. And then the wonderful young people are there in charge. That, that might be a little bit too long for the young people. So you should empower them as good as you can. Um, one more thing in the software I project I alluded to, we had many young people as well, PhDs and postdocs. And what we encouraged them is to speak up. And finally, they, they wrote a beautiful paper that has recently been at least preprinted and I believe already accepted for publication of what we can do as senior leadership as such consortium to make their life better and more easy and to learn more. And these are things like, listen to them, put them on the highest level of leadership of a consortium as well. They, they, they hardly ever disappoint. To give them specific tasks they can do well, to make them responsible to, to do these tasks and to help them and to mentor them in, in learning on, on, on the job. But there's so much we can do. And, well, I'm getting carried away a little bit in the idealistic mode. It is, of course, true that when you're a PhD student and you see uh, your supervising doing really awful stuff, it takes courage to speak up. And some people don't speak up, and I can understand that. It's awful, of course, but I can understand that. And other people speak up after they got their PhD degree, uh, which is understandable as well. And again, other people are so courageous, like the three PSU students who nailed uh, Dieter Stapel, a case you may have heard about before. Uh, they, the three of them, felt strong enough to be collective whistleblowers. And that happens quite often, that people team up to, to do the difficult thing. And that's the reason 
it's 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 awful to be a single solitary PhD student alone in an environment. You need to have a bunch of them because these people help each other enormously and they can feel stronger together. And then let's not forget uh, that most universities in, in, in many countries now have whistleblower arrangements. They don't always work and it can still be bad for your career. Uh, but you need to help people who are damaged by being a whistleblower and, and be understanding for people who should maybe become a whistleblower but decide not to because of the, 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 the awful side effects that are looming. It's, well, that's, that's the world we live in. Um, but the class is also half, half full. We're moving in the right direction, I believe. Indeed. While, while you were speaking, I, I had a thought because um, the reason I asked you that question is uh, because of an anecdotal story of actually undergraduate students who perhaps might not even be in a position to be brave enough to, to be a whistleblower as a PhD student and team up with someone. And the thought I had while you were speaking, and maybe it already exists, is there an organization, a 1-800 number that someone can call to get support, to get advice, to explain the situation, to speak anonymously and safely, to see what they can do and what the implications might be because not many students might even understand that. And it doesn't have to be students. It can be absolutely any individual. So, and it, it just seems that having this um, place uh, where you can go to if it's not in your university, because even that is a high risk because uh, somebody might call the head of the department and say, hold on, what's going on in your department there? So it depends on the cultural setting. It depends on the international setting. It might not happen in one country, but it might happen in another and career is still risking. So yeah, uh, you don't need to respond to this question unle unless you'd like to. But... Well, it's, 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 it's another great question and, and a question to which I don't have a very satisfactory answer I, I guess the, the the point is that that you're completely right. It it is risky to talk to people about your suspicions still when you are still in doubt about it, and also when you are more certain, it's still risky for you. Um, and and many universities in my country have whole systems of confidential counselors for this and for that and for that, and they are confidential, and they really are. I, I believe that. So, so that functions quite well. Um, and let's not forget that people pick their own mentors and, and I recommend people to pick their own mentors. So students may have in the family or, or know someone who is doing something in academia as well, completely unrelated. And you can talk to these people. Uh, it, it happens to me as well because I'm visible in research integrity. Uh, I get uh, many weird emails, but I get also very nice emails of people who I can help with a small telephone conversation or whatever. And I know from many colleagues that they, they fulfill similar tasks. I'm, I'm not sure that another helpline would help, but it, it might be an idea that can be on the table as well. Uh, but, but still, it's, it doesn't completely remove the, 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 the risks. Um, and it, it is neat true that mostly people need help to understand what happens and, and when they understand, then the second decision is whether they want to blow the whistle uh, when it's, it's completely wrong what, what they are seeing. But often they, they think they see something wrong, which is not the case or less so the case than they thought initially. And, and that's the kind of help you can offer them as well. Thank you. So we have a question from Carmela. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for connecting opening of data and research integrity. We've been studying that for years now. And so I could see recently in one analysis we did with Impact Observatory that it is improving. We are not 100% happy, but we are, it, the data sharing is being better than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So my question to you is, uh, do you see, have you seen any improvement of this research integrity, whatever you listed? And the other question is rather more complex. I've noticed there is a conflict of interest. You, you mentioned culture, the change of culture. There is a conflict of interest at the university levels. They would like to have their graduate students do their PhDs. So sometimes they can help them a little bit. And so, uh, so I do not know how you 
have you seen that? Because in your survey, you did not survey, unfortunately, institutions, you surveyed individuals, right? Yeah. That would be interesting to see how much universities, or especially in, in medicine, clinics, university teaching hospitals need to have PhDs, blah, blah, and so. Anyway, so the conflict of interest, I don't know how to deal with it easily. Thank you. That's, that's a great point as well. And, and to start with the last one, uh, of course, for institutions, there are perverse incentives as well. Uh, when you pay per PhD thesis, you get more PhD thesis that has been proven in many countries. That is what, what you get. And that means that attention is focused on that. And, and maybe the corner cutting will be involved. Uh, in the preparation of the last World Conference uh, on Research Integrity in Cape Town, I've been in South Africa several times, and there I discovered that the ministry is funding the universities per publication. That's on, almost the only parameter. Surprise, surprise, what you get? A lot of publications, uh, salami slicing, uh, republication, plagiarism, uh, co-authors from other universities, because it counts then in two universities or three or four or five universities. So perverse incentives are there at the level of institutions as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Going to a former question of you, um, open data, it, it, it might be improving. Um, I think so, it does. Uh, but recently it has been shown again that people who have a so-called open data statement in their paper, they hardly ever deliver when, when the data are really asked. And I've done open data analysis myself in the past um, and then discovered that the data sets were completely unusable. I believe that is improving nowadays. Mm -hmm. and, and, and your last question is about whether I see improvement in on research integrity indicators. Um, I don't know. I, the awareness is growing. And that means that you get more initially. It's, it's, it's uh, in, in nature a few months ago, Iman Oransky of the Retraction Watch, he also showed a, a, a rising graph of retractions. And he said, this is a sign of improvement. We're getting more retractions. And he said, we, we probably don't have yet one, one third or even one fifth of what we need to get as retractions. So when you see more weird stuff, it can all be a, a measure of improvement. And you see more people being caught on research integrity issues. And I believe that we should imp implement, say that this is an improvement as well. Although in the long run, it should go down again, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We have a question in the chat from um, Jana Christopher. So where do you see the main responsibility, the funders or uh, the research institutes or the individual researcher, the publishers um, or the individual journals? And how do you think uh, they can be pulled together to uh, make a real difference. Journals, publishers are overall not providing, proving to be uh, willing or fast enough to correct the record effectively. Um, how hopeful can we be? And what would be the incentives uh, for publishers and journals to act more responsibly? Lots of questions, but you can see all of them in the chat. Yeah, I, I, I saw them already. Uh, and hi, Jana. Good, nice to meet you this way again. Uh, th the point is, of course, that... Uh, She's completely right. We were in this together. There are many stakeholders uh, that uh, have a responsibility to improve research integrity uh, and to make the quality of research better. Uh, it is yes, the researchers, it's yes, the institutions, yet the publishers, and yet the funders. And especially funders are interesting because funders, they don't need to be popular. They, they can basically do whatever they want and we comply because we want their money. They should not misuse that power, of course, but they can change things. Open data got flying when funders started saying, hey, listen, you can get your grant, but we need open data. So th th then it's happening. Mm -hmm. For publishers and journals, it's more difficult because they are in a market competition game uh, although, on the other hand, the only thing they're really selling is quality assurance. Uh, and they better do it well, and they better start doing it better. And from that perspective, they can make change happen as well. Um, and they are, to some extent. Many journals uh, adopt that registered report format. 
many journals mandate uh, open uh, data statements and now they learn that they need to ask for more because it's it's not really happening when you have a statement only uh, and they also work on the downside uh, the sdm for instance has a research integrity hub which is a great suite of software uh, helping uh, editors and 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 also reviewers to detect bullshit in manuscripts like uh, faked uh, pictures, uh, like statistical tests that, that are senseless, like plagiarism, uh, like uh, citations to retracted papers, and, and so on and so forth, like use of chat GPT, that's, that's there in now as well, I believe. So yes, uh, we're all in it together. And it's, it's normally the saying was, well, we have one bad apple and that is an individual and let's sanction the bad apple and then science is great again. We now know that's not the case. It's, it's okay. a more systematic disease we're having and, we, and there is no magic bullet. Uh, the curation needs to come from many angles and all these parties have a role to play. 